On the evening of October 4th, 1912, a United States political candidate was in his hotel room in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In less than an hour, he was scheduled to deliver a very important speech to local voters he hoped to sway in his favor. Even though he was nervous, he was really excited about giving this particular speech because he and his speechwriters had spent weeks putting together this 50-page script that he was now holding in his hands. And so he paced around the room, flipping through the first couple of pages of the script, reciting lines before checking his watch and seeing that it was time to go. And so he took a deep breath, he took his thick 50-page document, folded it in half, and then tucked it inside his right inner jacket pocket. And when he was ready, he walked out his hotel door, down the front steps, and out the front door of the hotel where a huge crowd was waiting for him. People were singing his praises and yelling to him and trying to get him to react to them as he walked out of the hotel towards his car. And as he was walking, his own personal security detail had formed up around him and were doing their best to keep the crowd at bay. And when the candidate finally got to his open-air car, he stepped in inside and then stood up, took his hat off, and continued to wave to the crowd. And then right before his car was about to take off, there was a loud bang from somewhere out in the audience, and the candidate hunched over. He had been shot. His security detail immediately recognized who the gunman was, and they attacked him, kicking his gun away and putting him in a chokehold. And the rest of the crowd kind of forms up and begins beating on this gunman. And amidst all this chaos, the candidate, who's just been shot, stands up and yells to the crowd, don't kill him, don't kill him. Bring the gunman to me. And the crowd is so surprised that their candidate is not on the ground because again, he's just been shot, that they stop. They stop attacking the gunman. And even the security detail, they're just holding the guy in a chokehold, looking up at the candidate like, really, you're not down? You just got shot. And so the candidate looks at the gunman and he says, you know, why'd you do it? And the gunman stays silent. And so the candidate says, okay, just take this guy away. And so the security detail hand this guy off to the cops. And so now the crowd's all looking at the candidate, wondering how in the world he's acting like everything is totally okay, because again, he just got shot. And so this is when the candidate reaches into his jacket and he pulls out that thick script he had tucked inside of his right pocket and he holds it up to the crowd. And there's clearly a bullet hole that went through the script the script had stopped the bullet and saved the candidate's life. All of his aides were urging him to go to the hospital immediately, but the candidate refused and said, bring me to that speech. And just a couple of minutes later, the famous American president, Theodore Roosevelt, delivered his 50-page speech, although he did have to make some changes to it on the fly because there were holes on every page. On an icy cold December night in 1776, a farmer living in New Jersey looked out his window and thought he saw something move at the end of his road. He put his hands to the glass and tried to get a better look, but he couldn't see it. It was too dark, there was no illumination, but he didn't need to see it to know what it was. He could hear it coming. Panicked, he stumbled backwards, turned around, ran into his bedroom where he told his wife to stay in the house, keep the kids here, do not leave for any reason. And then this farmer bolted out his back door, hopped on his horse, and began blazing towards town. He didn't know how much time he had, but he knew he had to warn the German man, Johann Rahl. After riding for a couple of minutes, he arrived at the town of Trenton. He turned down a couple side roads, and then he arrived at this beautiful two-story home where Johann was staying. And so the farmer got off his horse and walked towards the front door and Right before he got there, a German soldier came outside, shut the door behind him, and told the farmer to stop. And the farmer told the soldier in English that he had to speak to Johann. He had a warning for him, but the German soldier didn't speak any English, and so there was this total miscommunication, and at some point, the German soldier indicated to the farmer that it was impossible for him to come inside, that Johann was actually playing cards and did not want to be disturbed, and so the farmer needed to leave. But the farmer was desperate and he pleaded with the soldier to let him speak to Johan. It was an emergency. He had a warning for him. But the soldier either again didn't understand or he just didn't care. And he tried to tell the farmer to leave once again. But the farmer really wasn't taking no for an answer. And so he pulled out a piece of paper and he scratched this ominous warning on it and he gave it to the soldier and he said, give this to Johan. And so the soldier reluctantly takes the note. He looks at it, it's in English, he can't read it. And so he just nods to the farmer and says, okay, I'll give it to Johan. Once the farmer had got back on his horse and left, the soldier turned around, went through the front door and walked back to the dining room of the house where he found Johan around a table with a bunch of other guys laughing and drinking and playing cards. And this soldier very reluctantly walks up to Johan, hands him the note, and apologizes for the interruption. And Johan looks up at him, he's obviously annoyed, and he scolds him for interrupting him. He takes the note and he looks at it and he can see that it's in English. And like the soldier who's brought it to him, Johan could not read English. 
And so he's looking around the table. He's got this great poker game going. He's having so much fun. He didn't want to step away and have to get a translator and read this note, which to him was probably meaningless anyways. And so he tells the soldier that, you know what, he'll read it later. And he takes the note and he puts it in his pocket and he goes back to playing poker. Johan would never read that note. And in a couple of hours, Johan would be dead. Johan Rahl was a colonel fighting for Great Britain during the American Revolution. And he and his Hessian brigade that had taken up residence in this home inside of Trenton, New Jersey, believed the American rebels were on the verge of defeat. And certainly they were not about to launch an attack now, not on a freezing cold December night. But they were wrong. That farmer was a British loyalist, and what he saw when he looked out the window at the end of his road was the famous American military general, George Washington, and his ragtag army after they had just completed their famous secret crossing of the Delaware River. That note Johann was handed was a warning that they were on the way. Had he bothered to read it, he and his well-trained Hessians could have very easily crushed Washington and his men, and that would have been the end of the American Revolution, and America would still be a British colony today. Instead, Johann and his men were caught off guard and wiped out, and the Americans would go on to win the war and their independence from Great Britain. In 1912, 37-year-old David Blair was a senior merchant seaman working for the British shipping company called White Star Line. In February of that year, he was informed by his company that he would be the second officer of this massive luxury cruise liner that was still being built in Northern Ireland. As the second officer, David's primary responsibility was the ship's navigational operations, amongst other things. Now, David had handled these responsibilities on other ships, but he'd never done it on a ship of this size. This would easily be the most challenging thing David had done in his career to date. But he told his family he was really excited about it. David immediately moved to Belfast where the ship was being built and he lived there for three months until construction was done. On April 2nd, the final rivet was put into the ship and it was launched successfully into the water. And then after that, David and the rest of the crew and staff got on board and they set sail. Their first stop was Southampton in the UK. And for this leg of the journey, it was just going to be the crew and the staff. Two days later, they arrived without incident. And for the next several days, the ship remained in port as the crew prepped it for its first true maiden voyage, which was going to be to New York City. On April 10th, all preparations had been made, and finally it was time to allow the paying customers to come on board. And in just a couple of hours, thousands of people were on board this huge ship. And just hours before they were set to depart, David was given some bad news. His bosses at White Star Line had decided that this journey was too high profile, and while David certainly had experience, he didn't have a lot of experience with huge ships. And so he was being replaced with someone who did. Understandably, he was crushed, but more than this being a disappointment, this 11th hour change was a huge hassle. With literally thousands of passengers getting in the way all over the ship, David needed to scramble and run all over the place and collect all of his things in the cabin, up on the bridge, in various closets he had put things. He had to do that as fast as he could before the ship took off. And so finally, after doing that with his last armful of luggage in hand, he said goodbye to the crew and to the staff. He said best of luck to his replacement and he walked off the ship for good. David, with all of his luggage, made his way to a hotel where immediately that night he wrote a letter to his family saying how disappointed he was and then after that he went to bed. The next morning when he was going through all of his luggage he discovered that he had taken a key by accident from the ship and this key was to a special closet that he was in charge of as the second officer that contained all of the ship's binoculars and so he felt terrible but there was nothing he could do. The ship had already left and was on its way to New York. And so the best he could do was he would mail the key back to them in New York when they got there. Back on board the ship, when they discovered this key was missing, they did figure out that David must have it because he was the only one who would have had the key and it's a brand new ship, so nobody else would have had it. But they decided that it wasn't worth turning around to go get this key. They figured their lookouts were skilled enough they could spot any obstructions with their naked eye. Well, five days later, that ship, the Titanic, struck an iceberg and sunk, killing 1,500 people. One of the very few survivors was a guy named Fred Fleet. He was one of the lookouts who actually saw the iceberg first, and he would testify at a Senate inquiry that if he had had binoculars, he would have been able to see the iceberg far enough in advance that they could have avoided it. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button socks with the kind that always slips down underneath your heel inside of your shoe.
2013, 46-year-old Paul Baxter started feeling sick. And then he developed a wicked cough that got so bad over a couple of days that he could barely speak because he was just coughing the entire time. And so he went to his doctor who quickly diagnosed him with pneumonia and put him on a treatment plan. But after several months of being on this plan and not having his condition improve at all, his doctor referred him to a respiratory clinic. There, they did an x-ray of his chest and they discovered a suspicious shadow in the lower right section of his lung. Doctors were concerned, especially given the fact that Paul was a long-term smoker, but before before they just put him under the knife and started cutting this out of his lung, they decided they would take a probe with a camera on the end of it and run it down into his lungs and actually have a look around inside. During the procedure, which Paul was awake for, the doctor put the probe down into that shadow area in his lung and right away he saw this lump. But when he zoomed in with his camera on the lump itself, he saw there was something orange sticking out of it. And so he told Paul there were little pincers at the end of this probe and he was gonna try to move the tissue around to try to see what this thing was. Was, and if it was a foreign object, he would try to pull it out. But when he tried to move around the tissue to get a better look, he couldn't get it dislodged. And so he pulled the probe out and he told Paul he would need to come back in a couple of days when he could use a longer and more powerful probe. And so Paul looks at the doctor and he's like, well, what is it? What is this orange thing inside of my lungs? And the doctor said, honestly, I have no idea, but it's not supposed to be in there. A few days later, Paul went back in for this follow-up procedure and the doctor using this longer, more powerful probe was able to go down and actually dislodge this orange thing from inside of his lungs. And as soon as he pulled it free, there was a camera screen that was watching in real time what this probe was seeing. And so Paul and the doctor and the other doctors that were in there as well, all got to see for the first time what this thing was. And it was this kind of triangular, small, orange thing that nobody had seen before. And so as it was getting pulled up and out of Paul's body, everyone's just watching the camera, wondering what this thing is. And then finally, the pinchers came out of Paul's mouth, revealing what it was holding on to, and nobody could believe what they were looking at. What it was holding on to was a small plastic orange traffic cone from a child's play toy set. And as soon as Paul saw it, a memory came rushing back to him, and he told the doctors when he was seven years old, he swallowed, or so he thought, a cone that looked an awful lot like this one, except he hadn't swallowed it, he had inhaled it. And then somehow for 40 plus years, he'd had no symptoms related to it until now when he developed that cough. Paul would say when he had this revelation in front of the doctors, there was a moment of silence and then everybody just started cracking up laughing because none of the doctors had seen anything like it before and didn't really know how to react to it. And so Paul was allowed to keep his traffic cone and after he left, his cough went away and he went back to normal. From the time Gareth Williams was a young boy, his parents knew he was extremely gifted. When he was just 17 years old, he achieved a first class honors mathematics degree from a university in his hometown of Wales. A couple of years after that, he had his PhD from the University of Manchester in England. And after that, he was accepted into a postgraduate course at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Cambridge. But he wouldn't finish that degree because his incredible academic achievements had got the attention of Britain's intelligence agencies, and they began recruiting him. In 2001, when Gareth was 23, Britain's communication headquarters, commonly known as GCHQ, which is one of Britain's main intelligence agencies, offered him a job as a codebreaker. He eagerly accepted the job, dropped out of Cambridge, and then moved into a modest apartment in Cheltenham, which is the resort town about 88 miles away from London where GCHQ is located. And there he would live and work for the next 10 years. Despite being an intensely private and shy person, Gareth was a highly valued team player whose genius in mathematics and technology helped his group win a number of Britain's highest awards for international code breaking. In 2009, one of Britain's other main intelligence agencies the famous Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6 for short, they were so impressed with Garrett that they offered him a job to come over and work for them. This was a very rare chance for Gareth to go operational and become a spy in the kind of Hollywood sense of the word. He would effectively become a real life James Bond, and so he jumped at the chance. But shortly after taking the job and moving to London, he regretted his decision. He hated the intense competitiveness within MI6, the flashy cars and flashy lifestyles, and the pressure to go out and party with your co-workers every weekend. Gareth just wanted to do his job and then be left alone. At GCHQ, nobody cared he felt that way. But at MI6, this behavior made him an outsider. Before he left MI6, he took his annual two-week vacation. 
but when the vacation was over, he didn't come back to work at his office in London. And for some reason, MI6 never checked in on him to see where he was. It wasn't until his sister called police after not hearing from him that anybody looked into his disappearance. On August 23rd, a uniformed officer went to Gareth's apartment in London to do a welfare check. After knocking on the door and not getting an answer from Gareth, the officer got the key to the apartment from the landlord and went inside. He yelled out for Gareth. There was no sign of him on the first floor. He went upstairs to see if maybe Gareth was up there. He's yelling for him the whole way as he's going up. He gets to the second floor. There's nobody up there, but there's a closed door. And what he finds on the other side of that closed door would make international headlines for weeks. When he opened the door, he walked into a bathroom and there was nothing unusual about the bathroom, except in the bathtub, there was this big red duffel bag. And inside of that duffel bag was the badly decomposed body of Gareth Williams. The zipper of the bag was padlocked shut on the outside and the key to this padlock was underneath Gareth's body inside of the bag. There were no fingerprints on the rim or inside the bathtub. There were also no fingerprints on the bag itself or on the two zippers or on the padlock or on the keys. Gareth's iPhone had been found nearby sitting on a table and it had been factory reset. And later investigators would determine it had been reset on August 15th, which was the last day Gareth was seen on CCTV footage. And it was also the day that they believe he died. According to the coroner, Gareth's body had no injuries on it. There was no sign of a struggle. And his toxicology report showed that he had no drugs or alcohol in his system. The thermostat inside of Gareth's apartment was jacked way up. So it was very hot inside of his apartment, despite the fact it was summer and it was the height of the summer in August. But regardless, the excessive heat in his apartment sped up the decomposition process and made it impossible to precisely determine a cause of death. Despite a lengthy investigation by police, there was never a conclusive determination as to what exactly happened to Gareth although there are many theories. Some say the Russian mafia killed him because right before he died, he had been focusing on money laundering in Britain that was tied to the Russian mafia, which would have made him a target. Another theory is MI6 had something to do with Gareth's death, which is why they were not so eager to go looking for him when he didn't come back from his vacation. In fact, one former MI6 agent has come out and said he believes there was a cover-up. He was interviewed by CNN and said that it looked like MI6 had gone into Gareth's apartment ahead of the police and wiped wiped it all down, removing fingerprints and DNA evidence. The last prominent theory is that Gareth did this to himself. It was discovered that he made occasional online visits to bondage sites, and at least one time he'd had to yell out to his landlord to help get him out of his bed because he had tied his wrist to the bed frame and couldn't get himself undone. But when two experts who were a part of the investigation attempted to put themselves inside of a similar sized duffel bag and lock it with the padlock on the outside, they couldn't do it despite trying over 400 times. And even if Gareth could have somehow physically got himself inside of this bag and locked it from the outside, how could he have done that without leaving fingerprints all over the bag, all over the lock, the zippers, all over the tub? Because when he was found, he didn't have gloves on. Ultimately, despite the red flags, Gareth's death was determined to be probably an accident and was closed three years after his death. On the afternoon of April 10th, 2018, 16-year-old Kyle Plush had just finished classes at Seven Hills High School in Cincinnati, Ohio. He walked out the school's doors and began walking straight across towards the sophomore parking lot where his car, a minivan, was located. Although Kyle had suffered from a spinal cord injury at a young age, he had made a remarkable recovery. He not only walked after his injury, he ran. He went downhill skiing, he biked, he swam, he played soccer. But of all the sports he enjoyed playing, tennis was his favorite. He had joined the high school tennis team and had become one of their best and most popular players. That afternoon, he had a match scheduled, so he needed to get into his minivan and get out his tennis racket and his tennis shoes. And so he made it to the vehicle a little bit after 3 p.m. He slid open the door, he threw his backpack inside, and then he climbed towards the third row back seat of the van where his sneakers were sitting on the bench seat. And so he got to the third row, he turned around and sat down facing the front of the minivan. He took off his school shoes, put on his tennis shoes, and then he got up onto his knees and turned around so he's facing the back of the van. His knees are on the third row seat. And he began reaching down into the trunk to reach for his bag that contained his tennis racket. And as he was reaching, the third row itself, what he was kneeling on, flipped backwards, dumping him headfirst into the trunk, except all of Kyle's body did not just go tumbling into the trunk space. Instead, his upper half made it about halfway down. He tumbled with the seat. And then he got stuck upside down when the top of that third row seat 
caught his chest and pressed it up against the back hatch of the van. And so Kyle's upside down, his hands are free in the trunk space, but they're too close to the ground where he can't really press himself out of this position he's in. And this third row seat that's come loose and trapped him like this, it's not locked in position. And so if he goes up at all, the seat goes with him. If he comes down at all, the seat comes with him. And so even trying to push himself back out again, he wouldn't be able to clear the seat because it would just come with him and then come back down again. And so he probably looked for places to pull himself down, hoping that might be a way to clear the obstruction, but there was nothing to grab onto and his lower half would not have been able to slip through that gap even if the seat was stationary because no person is supposed to get through that tiny little gap. There was also no inside handle on the back hatch that Kyle could have grabbed and potentially opened the back door. And so he was entirely reliant on somebody showing up and opening the trunk to get him out. But the scariest part of this situation was that that loose third row that came forward and trapped Kyle against the back of the van, it weighed nearly a hundred pounds and it was driving against his chest. And so he would have had to fight with every breath he took in, pushing up that 100 pounds just to get a marginal breath. But worse than that, if Kyle didn't constantly put air into his chest and keep it full and inflated and strong, that seat would literally crush his chest and kill him. Kyle knew he had to find a way to signal someone that he was in this car. He couldn't reach his phone because it was up in his pants pocket and that meant getting up around the obstruction and he couldn't do that but he had a smartphone and he knew he could use voice assisted calling. And so at 3.14 PM, he used his iPhone's voice assistant, Siri, to call 911. As soon as the dispatcher picked up, Kyle was frantic and he was yelling, help, 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 I'm trapped in a minivan in the Seven Hills parking lot, someone needs to get me out. But the dispatcher couldn't really understand what Kyle was saying, because you gotta remember, Kyle is yelling from in the trunk space through this collapsed seat up to his phone in his pocket. And the dispatcher was just having a hard time understanding what he was saying. Although if you listen to the audio, it's plainly clear that Kyle is in distress. You can hear that he's yelling and you can hear him banging, which apparently is him banging on the inside of the car. And so they kept asking Kyle, where did you say you are? What's going on? But Kyle, he can't hear his phone. So Kyle just kept frantically repeating his situation, saying his name, where he was located, what was happening to him, in hopes that maybe somebody on the other end of the line would understand what was going on and would come save him. Towards the end of the call, Kyle tells the dispatcher that he thinks he's going to die here. And when the call does cut out, the dispatcher tries calling Kyle back, but it goes to voicemail and his voicemail only indicated his name was Kyle. It didn't give a last name or anything about him. Not knowing if this was real or a hoax, the dispatcher wrongly labeled this call as unknown trouble when they broadcast it to police. And the dispatcher did not communicate that Kyle was obviously in distress. He was screaming and banging on something throughout the call and even referenced that he thought he was going to die. Had the dispatcher given Kyle's call a higher priority, fire and rescue would have been alerted and they could have used their advanced mapping technologies to pinpoint where Kyle's cell phone was and they could have found him that way. Instead, local police were sent to the Seven Hills High School area to go look around the different parking lots that this caller could have been in. But there was nearly a dozen of these parking lots associated with the high school making it a huge search area. And again, these police officers were not even aware what they were looking for. They were looking for unknown trouble associated with some caller somewhere around this huge high school. And so the police show up and begin kind of meandering through all these parking lots, staying in their vehicle, just kind of looking around and they don't see any problems. Although in reality, they were right near Kyle the entire time. At 3.35 PM, with the police still patrolling the parking lots around the high school, Kyle used Siri to call 911 again and a different dispatcher answered. Now, at this point, it's been 21 minutes since Kyle's first 911 call. And so the weight of that third row is becoming unbearable. His voice is very weak. It's very faint. You can tell he has labored breathing and every word is punctuated with a long silence as he tries to get out anything he can to try to help himself. And one of the things he says to the dispatcher as soon as they answer is, if I die, I need you to tell my mother that I love her. And there's a silence. And Kyle asks them, can you hear me? And there's still a silence. And he says, this is not a joke. I'm trapped in my gold minivan in the Seven Hills sophomore parking lot. If you don't get here soon, I'm going to die. There's another silence. And then Kyle says, hey Siri. And then there's silence. And he says, hey Siri again, and again, and again. And then it goes silent. 
The second dispatcher had heard Kyle on this call, but for some reason did not relay to the patrolling officers in the area Kyle's dire situation or his exact position that he was in this gold Honda Odyssey in the sophomore parking lot. For some reason, that was not communicated to those officers. And so two minutes after the second 911 call ended, those two officers left thinking, there's nobody here, there's no trouble. And that was it, Kyle was left all alone. Six hours later, Kyle's father went out looking for him after he didn't come home from his tennis match. And he found his son's minivan parked in the sophomore parking lot at the high school. And when he went up to it, it was too late. His son was still trapped upside down in the back in the trunk, and he had died after the third row had finally crushed his chest, causing him to asphyxiate. Kyle's family is in the middle of a wrongful death lawsuit filed against the city and several employees, and so the legal outcomes of this case are still pending. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, the next time you get to a four-way intersection at the same time as the like button, politely tell them to go on, and as soon as they begin to move, immediately T-bone them. Born in South Texas in 1935, Roy Benavidez was orphaned as a young child and sent to live with his uncle. As a young teen, he had to drop out of school to work in the beet and cotton fields just to help support his family. When he turned 18, he decided he wanted to get away from his hometown and do something bigger with his life, and so he enlisted in the army, and shortly after that, he went to airborne school and then was assigned to the very famous 82nd Airborne Division. In October of 1964, Roy was a part of the first 125,000 Americans sent to Vietnam. While on a classified operation that required Roy to dress up as an enemy combatant, he stepped on a landmine in the middle of the jungle and nobody else was with him, so he's totally stranded. But fortunately, a squad of US Marines came upon him, but from what he was wearing, they assumed he was an enemy soldier, and so they almost walked past him, but someone thought to just flip him over and see who he was, and they discovered he was American and he had American dog tags on. And so he was evacuated from Vietnam and sent to an American hospital, and there a doctor would tell him that he had a serious spinal injury and that it was unlikely he would ever walk again. And Roy's first reaction was, please don't discharge me from the army. Because for Roy, the army was his life. It was all he had. He was incredibly proud of it. And he desperately wanted to go back to Vietnam. And so he pleaded with the doctors and the nurses, please let me have some time to try to regain my strength in my legs so that I don't get medically discharged. And so they said, look, you're going to get medically retired if you aren't walking within the year. And so every night when his doctors and nurses would leave, he would fall out of his bed and then drag himself across the ground to the wall and then he'd pull himself up and try to put weight on his legs and attempt to build strength back up and retrain himself how to walk and after six months of doing this every night he did literally reteach himself how to walk he built up strength in his legs and his doctors and nurses they're watching this transformation during the day but they're not seeing him at night and they're telling him this is a miracle we've never seen this before we've never seen someone recover so quickly and Roy just stayed quiet because he wanted to make sure he was allowed to keep doing that every night. And so finally, after those six months, his doctors and nurses agreed that, yep, he's good. He can stay in the army. But the army said they wanted him to take a desk job because he had already been so badly wounded in combat. And Roy didn't want that. He pleaded with them to let him go back to the 82nd, but they said, no, we're not gonna risk you getting hurt again. And so he was sent to North Carolina for his desk job. And as soon as he got there, he began training like a maniac every minute of every day, trying to get in the best shape of his life because his plan in his head was once he got there, he would try out for special forces. He would try to become an army green beret, which is the premier combat unit in the army. It's one of the hardest ones to get into. And their training program is in North Carolina. And so after a few months, he was in amazing shape and he asked his superiors, can I go try out to be a Green Beret? And they're like, I can't believe you're even walking, but you know what? You've come this far, you can go try out. And just a couple of months later, Roy Benavides was a Green Beret. A year later in 1968, so four years after Roy was nearly killed by that landmine, he was sent back to Vietnam for his second combat tour. And as soon as he got there, the fighting was very intense. On May 2nd of that year, Roy had a day off and he was spending his day off at a church service inside of their wooden shack they had built on their base. 
And while he was in there listening to the chaplain, he heard a radio call come out from the communications table that was just outside of the shack he was in. And it sounded like someone was in trouble. And so he ran outside to listen to the radio. And what he heard was this very desperate call from someone yelling into the radio, get us out of here. And in the background of this radio call is just a constant barrage of gunfire. The call for help came from a 12 man army special forces team that had been ambushed by an entire North Vietnamese army infantry battalion. To put that in perspective, that is 12 special forces members of which many of them Roy knew personally in the middle of the jungle where on all four sides, there are over 1000 enemy combatants. As Roy is hearing this distressing transmission come across the radio, he hears overhead the sound of incoming helicopters. And he looks and he sees there's three birds that are coming towards their base. And so he runs over to the landing zone to greet the helicopters as they come in. And he can see as they're landing, they are all completely covered in bullet holes. And as soon as they touch down, Roy runs up to one of the door gunners, which is this 19 year old kid. And he looks kind of dazed. And Roy asks him, you know, what's going on? Where'd you guys just come from? Were you out there at that ambush site? Do you know what's going on with that 12 man team? and the door gunner just collapses into Roy's arms and dies. He had been shot up. These three helicopters had attempted previously to fly into the jungle and save that 12 man team, but they had been shot off and had been unsuccessful. Roy helped get the dead door gunner out of the helo. And then he turned to the pilot of this helo where the door gunner was. And he asked him, you know, are you gonna go back out there and try to save those guys? And the pilot was obviously so distraught about the death of his door gunner. And also the fact that there are 12 men out there that they could not rescue that he's chomping at the bit. He wants to go back out there. And Roy immediately volunteers, hops in the helo, and they head out to go rescue this 12 man team. So not only are there only two of them, but Roy was so eager to volunteer himself, he forgot his gun. So all he had on him was his knife and some medical supplies. But nonetheless, the pilot just keeps flying towards the ambush site, which was in Cambodia. It was this really dense stretch of jungle. And as they got closer and closer, gunfire started coming out of the jungle towards the helicopter. And so the pilot had to do this kind of constant zigzagging just to avoid getting shot down. And so as they're zigzagging, they notice there's some smoke coming out of the jungle. And it was very clear that this 12 man team is trying to signal to the helo, here we are, come get us, because they can hear the helicopters coming in. And so the pilot tried to fly down and get as close as he could, but any time he got even marginally close to this team, the rate of fire would pick up so dramatically that the helo was just about to get shot down. And so the pilot began to turn away and he told Roy, we can't get any closer. We're gonna have to get more people in here. And Roy just tells him, no, get as low as you can and I will jump out into the jungle. And the pilot turns to him and he's like, you can't do that, you're gonna get killed. And Roy somehow convinces this pilot that he alone, without a gun, is totally competent. Just put me down in that jungle and everything's gonna be just fine. And so the pilot said, okay. And he lowered right over the canopy of this jungle about a hundred yards away from where this 12 man team is trapped. And without any hesitation, Roy just leaps off the helicopter into the jungle. Now you gotta understand that where he was jumping was where the enemy was. He was literally jumping, no parachute, no gun, no anything, just crashing through the canopy onto the jungle floor where he'll definitely be surrounded by enemy combatants. And so he plummets through the canopy, he smashes onto the ground, he pops up and just starts running through the jungle with enemies on either side of him towards the 12 man down team. And the enemy was so surprised to just see this American running through the middle of the jungle by himself with no weapon that they hesitated for a minute and they didn't open fire on him. But when they did open fire, Roy got shot in the face, in the back of the head, in the leg. They threw a grenade that detonated at his back and sent shrapnel into him, but none of it stopped Roy. He just kept on running until he made it to this downed 12 man team. And when he got to them, they were in terrible shape. They were doing their best to stay behind some trees, but rounds were coming in from all directions and four of them were already dead and the others that were still alive were critically wounded. In fact, one of the most able-bodied of the surviving 12 had been shot in the head and was missing an eye and could barely see out of the other one. And so he's fighting to stay conscious and he's generally trying to shoot in one direction. But I mean, that's their best guy at this point to give you a state of how they were doing. But Roy ran up to this guy, he pulled him down, he gave him a shot of morphine in the arm and he repositioned him because he couldn't really see and told him where to shoot his gun. And then under a constant hail of bullets, Roy low crawled to each of the other living team members and gave them morphine shots and then began dragging each and every one of them away from the ambush site to this other area where there was better cover. And there was a nearby clearing that he believed a helicopter could land in if the pilot was really daring. 
On one of Roy's last trips back to the ambush site to get the last few surviving members, he saw two other men that were part of this team that had been totally cut off from the main group. And when Roy had jumped into the jungle and ran in, all his adrenaline had kicked up and he just hadn't done a head count. And so he didn't realize there were two other people over there. And so without any hesitation, he grabbed a gun off of one of the dead enemy soldiers and just began running towards this downed two-man team. And as he's running, he's shooting wildly in every direction, trying his best to suppress enemy fire, but it's really doing nothing. He's just dodging bullets as he's running. And right as he got close to the two-man team, a bullet went flying through his thigh, just clean through his thigh, and it didn't slow him down. He got to the two-man team, totally unfazed, and he says, okay, get ready to move. He stands back up and he starts shooting again in both directions and tells them to crawl back to the main unit. And so he stands up and continues to shoot in both directions until these two men get back over to the main group. Once they were safely with the group, Roy again ran the gauntlet with with this huge gaping hole in his thigh all the way back to the main group. And so now that Roy had a full head count of all of the living members of the downed 12-man team, and he had moved them all to this slightly safer area relatively with better cover and concealment, he threw a smoke grenade into the nearby clearing he had found in hopes that the helo pilot overhead would see the smoke and be willing to come down and land. The pilot that had dropped off Roy had not actually left the area. He had moved away from all the fighting, but he was loitering in case something like this happened. And so he saw the smoke and without any hesitation, he flew right over, taking rounds the whole time, pinging off the side of his helicopter, and he touched down right in this tiny little clearing. And so as the semi-able-bodied surviving members of this unit begin making their way over to the helicopter, Roy began running around a little ways off from the helicopter, picking up rifles off of the dead enemy and shooting back at the enemy, dropping that gun, running over, picking up another one, engaging the enemy over and over again, doing everything he can to try to protect the extract of his men behind him. And once Roy turned around and saw most of the men had made it onto the helicopter, Roy believed it was his chance now to run out and try to collect some of their dead teammates. And so Roy just takes off into the jungle, right into enemy fire. He's got two guns in his hands and he's running. He's trying to engage the enemy as he's going. And then he comes across the first of his dead teammates. And it happens to be one of his very best friends, a man named Leroy Wright. And so he grabs Leroy and begins trying to haul him back towards the chopper. And as he's moving, Roy gets shot again, this time through his stomach. So he tries to keep himself on his feet, and as he's doing that, a grenade detonates behind him, sending more shrapnel into his body, knocking him unconscious. When he came to, he started looking around, and he could see in the tree line dozens of enemy soldiers running towards him. And so he knew if he tried to bring Leroy back to the chopper, that was a suicide mission. And so he had to leave his friend behind. He jumped up, and with all of these enemy combatants just constantly engaging him, he ran all the way back, zigging and zagging back to the main group. And when he got there, expecting to see the helicopter, Helicopter, he found the helicopter had actually crashed onto the ground and was on fire. It had been shot down while he was unconscious. And so he ran over to the flaming shell of this helicopter and he saw the pilot had been killed, but some of the men that had climbed on, the men that he had just rescued, they had survived the crash and subsequent explosion. And so Roy just leaps into the burning vehicle and starts throwing these survivors out. But then he leapt back out, he picked up a gun, continued to engage the enemy, and then began picking up these wounded men and dragging them even farther away to another area that was safely away from this crash site because he knew if he didn't get all these people away from the crash site pretty soon mortars are going to come raining down on this area because their enemy is going to want to kill any of the people that are going to try to rescue the people that were on the helicopter and so roy finally gets all of the survivors over to this new area and he's looking around and he can see there are still hundreds of enemy fighters that are not that far away from them just constantly engaging them and roy's doing his best to grab guns off the ground and shoot the enemy but there's just too many of them and he's looking around at his team and everybody's on the brink of death and so is roy he's just functioning on adrenaline at this point and he thinks to himself the only way we can get out of this is if we call in what's called a danger close airstrike so what you need to understand about how airstrikes work in a combat zone is there's someone called a controller that is on the ground directing the aircraft overhead they're the ones effectively telling the plane where to shoot and so a danger close airstrike is when the controller tells the aircraft overhead, I want you to drop a bomb right here, giving them the grid coordinates, but where they're telling them to drop is basically in the same position where the controller is. And you'd only do it if you're being overrun. It's a way to ensure your enemy gets taken out, even if that means taking yourself out. Now, the goal of the controller is not to drop the bomb on themselves or their team. 
The goal of the controller is to get that airstrike as close as you can to your position without killing you. And so Roy, who's physically wrecked, he's getting shot at, he's got bullet holes all over him, it's totally chaotic. He pulls out his map, he calmly finds his grid coordinates, he calls it into the aircraft overhead, and he calls in a beautiful precision napalm strike that does not affect his team at all. He calls in multiple gun runs. None of them affect his team, despite them all being considered danger close airstrikes. And so Roy just continuously called in attack run after attack run, taking out enemy combatants all around them, completely suppressing the fire. But at some point, the aircraft overhead ran out of fuel and had to leave. And at that point, the surviving enemy combatants, which still numbered in the hundreds, they popped their heads up and they unleashed a hellacious volley of fire in which Roy again got shot clean through the leg. And so now Roy's looking around and he's realizing they're pretty much out of options. They don't have aircraft overhead. Roy's basically out of ammunition and there's no dead guy's guns around for him to grab. All of his team members are basically on the brink of death. And so Roy's thinking to himself, any minute now we're gonna get overrun. And so he crawls to each of his surviving teammates and he gives them one last shot of morphine to at least make their death painless. And then at the 11th hour, another helo comes blazing into the jungle and opens fire on the enemy, pushing them back. Roy is immediately invigorated and motivated because now he sees an opportunity to potentially survive this. And so once again, he grabs his teammates and begins schlepping them over to the helicopter. And after he believed he got the last of them on board, he turned and saw two of his teammates had fallen down farther back in the jungle and the enemy was closing in on them. And so Roy, like always, without any hesitation, just starts running towards them. And as he's just about to reach them, an enemy soldier that had apparently run out of ammunition leapt out of the jungle and smashed Roy on the side of the head with their rifle butt, fracturing his skull. And so Roy falls to the ground and the soldier jumps on top of him and smashes his face, breaking his jaw. And then the soldier turns his rifle around. There's a bayonet on the front side and he begins impaling Roy over and over again. And Roy, like out of a movie, grabbed the rifle, pulled it out of himself, threw the soldier on the ground, jumped up, got on top of him, drew his bowie knife, and proceeded to kill this soldier. And after he was done with that, he ran over to the two downed men. He grabbed one of them with his left hand. He picked up a rifle with the other. And as he's dragging this guy back to the chopper, he shoots and kills two more enemy combatants. So he finally gets this guy back to the chopper. He runs back, gets the last guy, throws him back in the helicopter. And then finally, Roy is the very last living American to hop in the helicopter and the helicopter takes off. On the helo ride back, Roy was in very rough shape and had to literally hold his insides inside of his stomach. And so when they finally landed back at base and Roy was hauled off of this helicopter, he wasn't moving and the doctors and nurses didn't really even know where to start with him. He had so many injuries. He had 37 significant holes in his body from gunshot wounds, from bayonet wounds, from shrapnel. And so they started trying to treat him, but there was no heartbeat, no pulse. And so they declared him dead. Roy's body was moved into a body bag. And as the doctor was zipping it up again, Roy spit in his face because Roy had no other way to communicate. His jaw was so badly broken from that rifle butt, he couldn't move his jaw and his eyes were sealed shut from all the blood on his face that had dried. And so his only way to communicate was to spit. And so unbelievably, Roy was still alive. And so they took him out of the body bag and they shipped him to Japan for intensive surgery. And then he was transferred to Texas where he spent a year rehabbing from his severe injuries. Roy was immediately given the Distinguished Service Cross and was put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the US military's highest award for valor. But the paperwork took a really long time. And so Roy was not actually given the Congressional Medal of Honor until 1981. Of the 12 men that were trapped in that jungle, eight would survive all thanks to Roy Benavides. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of people call me a hero. I appreciate the title. But the real heroes are the ones that gave the life of this country. Roy passed away in 1998 as a result of complications from diabetes. He was 63 years old. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please take out all of the like buttons trash bags from their trash cans and then proceed to throw various perishable saucy foods inside.
1926, Jack Churchill graduated from one of the UK's most prestigious military academies called Sandhurst, thus becoming an army officer. His first assignment was to an infantry unit stationed in Burma, but when he got there, it was peacetime, so Jack didn't have much to do. But instead of just sitting around all day, Jack did what any other restless young military officer would do, and he mastered the bagpipes, despite being 0% Scottish. He also took a trip across the entire Indian subcontinent on his motorcycle, almost entirely on unpaved roads. But in 1936, despite these incredible side hobbies, he just wasn't really that interested in being a part of the military when there wasn't anything going on, and so he decided to get out. He moved to Nairobi, Kenya, where he became a newspaper editor slash male model slash movie extra. During his off time, he still took his bagpiping very seriously, placing second in a prominent piping competition in 1936. He also picked up another hobby, archery, and he became so good at it so quickly that he was chosen by England to represent them in the Archery World Championships in 1939. Later that same year, when World War II broke out, Jack decided now's a good time to get back into the army. So he rejoined the army and he was promptly sent to France to help defend their borders against a potential Nazi invasion. But shortly after Jack arrived, Hitler was able to push through those defenses and he launched a brutal blitzkrieg campaign against the Allies in France. Blitzkrieg is a military tactic that's basically an all-out attack all at once with everything you got. So planes, tanks, artillery, infantry, you just send all of it in an attempt to overwhelm your enemy before you run out of resources. And in this case, Hitler's Blitzkrieg was successful. In just six weeks, they not only invaded France, they conquered it. But during that six week battle for France that the Allies ultimately lost, Jack made a name for himself by employing two particular weapons that nobody else in World War II was using. He is the only one who used these weapons for the entirety of World War II. Jack and two other infantrymen were up on this hill overlooking this town that was full of Nazis. And at some point, five Nazis come running out to the edge of this town and they duck behind a wall that's about 30 meters away from Jack. And one of these Nazis stands up and quickly crumples to the ground. And his four Nazi comrades look to see what happened to him. And they see a dead man on the ground with the back end of an arrow jutting out of his chest. And that arrow was fired by none other than Jack Churchill. Because for the duration of World War II, he didn't carry a gun. He didn't need a gun. Instead, he carried a bow and arrow and a long broadsword. Although periodically he would scoop the weapons up off of dead enemy soldiers and he would fire those. When asked why he didn't just carry a gun in the first place, he responded, any officer that goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. From then on, he became Mad Jack and his peers loved him but his leadership hated him. They said he was setting a terrible example that no one should be running around with a sword and a bow and arrow, but he was so effective, they let him continue. Throughout the brutal six week battle for France, Jack would lead dozens of these small raids against the Nazis and he would just pick them off one by one with his bow and arrow and with his sword. And in one particular raid, he got shot through the neck but he was so nonchalant about it that when he got back to base, someone was like, hey, Jack, you're bleeding. And he was like, oh yeah, I am. They were like, well, what happened? He's like, ah, pfft, machine gun. After the allies finally lost this battle for France and were forced to evacuate, they found a diary from one of the British soldiers. And in it, he talks about the one thing that motivated him and the other troops around him. And that was the sight of Mad Jack running hither and thither with his bow and arrow and his broadsword. For his bravery in France, Jack was awarded the Military Cross. After leaving France, Jack heard about this new unit, the commandos, that was being stood up to aggressively sabotage Nazi operations, and they were looking for volunteers. And Jack didn't know much about what they were going to do, but they promised combat, and so he was all for it, and he volunteered. The commando unit would go on to become the famous British Special Forces, and the training they put Jack and the other volunteers through was absolutely brutal and Jack just loved it. He loved being in the commandos. After graduation in 1941, Jack was put in command of a commando unit that was tasked with going to this Norwegian town of Vogsoy and taking down a Nazi garrison there. And so they loaded up into their amphibious landing craft and Jack's got his kilt on and he's got his bagpipes and he plays the bagpipes on the entire transit over to Vogsoy to pump up the commandos. And then Jack's landing craft was the first to reach the shores. And when its ramp came down, Jack was the first off and he just kept playing his bagpipes, despite the fact that the Nazis now see them and they're shooting at them. So rounds are impacting around him as he's blaring his bagpipes. And only when he finished his song did he shoulder his bagpipes, 
pull out a grenade. He saw some Nazis running along the ridge line. He throws a grenade at them and pulls out his sword and runs into battle. In just a few hours, the Nazi garrison had fallen and Jack was awarded his second military cross. During the Italian amphibious landings in 1943, Jack again was in charge of a commando unit and they were tasked with capturing a Nazi observation post that was in this town just outside of Salerno. It was well defended and fortified and Jack and his men were outnumbered 20 to one. So Jack came up with a genius plan. Instead of using stealth tactics, he broke his small team into six different groups and he placed them all around the outside of this town. And it was nighttime, so the Nazis did not see them setting up. And then on Jack's call, he had them all yell out at the exact same time, Commando! And the Nazis in the town were so caught off guard by all this yelling coming from all around them, they assumed a huge force is coming to take over this town. And so they went on the defensive. And so after their big war cry, Jack and his group are the first to charge down into this town. And Jack and one other guy would actually splinter off and they would discover this big group of Nazis that were setting up their mortars. And so Jack and this guy sneak up behind one of them and Jack grabs him from behind, holds this sword to his throat and orders him to tell the rest of the team to surrender. And so the rest of the team who vastly outnumber Jack and the other guy, they turn around and they see this lunatic wearing a kilt, wielding a sword. He's got bagpipes slung over his shoulder along with a bow and arrow. And they're like, okay, we give up. Shortly after, the rest of the Nazis in this town would surrender to Jack and his men, and for his actions, Jack would be awarded the Distinguished Service Order. In 1944, Jack was in Yugoslavia with the commandos, trying to capture a strategically valuable location called Point 62. And when every man in his team was either killed or severely wounded, and when Jack had run out of arrows, instead of surrendering, he pulled out his bagpipes and started playing until a grenade detonated behind him, knocking him unconscious. The Nazis captured him and sent him to Berlin to be interrogated because they believed, because of his last name, Churchill, that he was connected to or related to the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He wasn't, not at all, so they ordered Jack to be sent to a concentration camp. On his way out of Berlin, Jack secretly flicked a lit cigarette butt into one of his interrogator's offices, and he lit it on fire, but nobody knew it was him. And so Jack arrives at this concentration camp, and he's only there for a couple of months before he and another British military officer managed to escape by crawling underneath one of the barbed wire fences. They had slowly burrowed a tunnel without anybody noticing, and then they jumped down into this abandoned drainage pipe, and they crawled out to freedom that way. But their freedom would be short-lived because they only made it a couple of miles before they were recaptured by the Nazis. And so they were ordered to go to another concentration camp that was considered much more secure. But after only having been at this new concentration camp for less than a year, once again, Jack was able to escape. This time it was because there was a power outage at the camp and Jack just put a shovel down and casually walked out the front gates and nobody noticed. He walked 150 miles in the treacherous terrain of the Alps, surviving on vegetables he had stolen from people's gardens. And then finally, eight days later, he came across a United States armored division and they took him in and reconnected him with British troops. And then he was ultimately sent back to England. And while Jack was free, he was very frustrated that the war in Europe was effectively over and he had missed most of it. And so he requested a transfer to go out to Burma to fight against the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. But as soon as he got there, the Americans had just dropped the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan, abruptly ending World War II. And when Jack heard about this, he was so disappointed he would not get to do any more fighting. He was quoted as saying, ah, if it wasn't for those Yanks, we could have kept this war going for another 10 years. Even though the war was over, Jack desperately wanted to get into combat at least one more time. And so he went to jump school and qualified as a parachutist at the age of 40. And with this new qualification, qualification, he was assigned to a light infantry unit and they were deployed to Palestine to train their army how to better fight the Arab forces. And while he was there, he gained even more fame when he defended a Jewish medical convoy from an Arab ambush. And he did this all while wearing a kilt. Another time, he and 12 of his men helped evacuate 700 people from a Jewish hospital that was under attack from Arab forces. After Palestine, Jack came back to England and eventually retired from the army and then begrudgingly took a desk job within the Ministry of Defense. And every day on his commute home on the train, he would take his briefcase and throw it out the window as they were moving. What he had figured out was if he threw it at the exact right moment, it would land in the backyard of his house and he wouldn't need to 
carry his briefcase from the station to his house. But he didn't explain that to any of the other passengers on the train. They just figured there's some crazy guy who keeps throwing his briefcases out the window. In his retirement, he also became an extremely talented surfer. And at one point, he wanted to surf the Severn Boar, which is this huge wave in southwestern England that nobody else had surfed before. And locals that were familiar with this treacherous wave, they cautioned him and said, you really shouldn't do this. And he looked at them and he just said, eh, I'll be all right. And then he proceeded to be the first person ever to successfully ride that wave. Jack would ultimately die in 1996. He was 89 years old. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come out with you for a very casual get together. And when you're about halfway through dinner, start aggressively hard selling your multi-level marketing scheme. In 2019, Robert Nishimoto was a 71-year-old retired professor of sociology from the University of Southern California. After his retirement, he had moved back home to Hawaii to spend his twilight years with friends and family. On Saturday, November 2nd of that year, Robert suddenly felt motivated to go out into his backyard and finally do a huge cleanup. His grass was fine, he took care of that, but the very back of his property was totally overgrown with bushes and shrubs, and the trees were totally long and had not been trimmed in some time. And so he figured he would just go back there and hack a bunch of it down. And so that morning he rounded up all of his yard working tools and he headed out to the back of his property and he got to work. And all day his neighbors saw him slowly making progress as he kind of hacked his way towards the back of his property. And by the evening that night, it looked like he was almost done. Two days later on Monday, Robert's friends were at their favorite restaurant in town waiting for Robert to show up for lunch. This was something they did all the time, but Robert was running late. So one of them texted Robert to ask where he was, but he didn't get a response. After waiting for almost an hour and a half, his friends grew concerned because Robert was not the type of guy to just blow off a lunch meeting and not tell anyone where he was. He was far more likely to be the guy that showed up early and then hounded the others about where they were. And so the friends decided they would just drive by Robert's property to make sure everything was okay. But when they pulled onto a street, they saw down the end of the road in front of Robert's house were fire trucks and police cars and tons of commotion. It would turn out nobody had seen or heard from Robert since two days earlier when he was out in his backyard doing that yard work and when his family had tried to get in touch with him all weekend they hadn't been able to and so finally on this Monday right as the lunch friends are arriving at Robert's property Robert's own family had called the police to do a welfare check on Robert and what they discovered was horrifying a police officer had gone up to Robert's front door and knocked there was no answer the door was locked so the officer went around to the back of the house and knocked on the back door again there was no answer but the back door was open and so the officer opened it up he yelled for Robert there was no answer. The officer stepped inside to just have a look around to make sure Robert was okay. And he went room by room and there was nothing in there. He's yelling out for Robert. There's no sign of him. There's no sign of a commotion or anything. And so he turns around and goes back out the back door into the yard and he looks towards the back of the property and he sees there's some yard working tools that are just laying on the ground. And next to it looks like there's some sort of divot in the ground. And so it intrigued the officer. So he began walking across the yard towards these yard working tools and this divot. And as he got closer and closer to this divot, he saw there was a small hole in the center of this divot in the ground. And so the officer made it right up to the edge of this strange indentation on the ground. And he looked into this little hole and then all of a sudden the ground kind of collapsed into itself, revealing a two foot wide hole where the small hole had been. The officer jumped back to keep from falling in. And after a few moments, he stood back up and he walked very cautiously to the edge of this hole and he tried to shine his light down into it, but he couldn't see the bottom. It was obviously a very deep hole. And so he carefully moved forward, testing every step to ensure the ground was not going to erode underneath his foot. And then finally, he got right to the edge where he could shine his light all the way down to the bottom, 22 feet below. And there on the bottom was Robert's body. In cities, people are afraid of falling into manholes. In parts of Hawaii, people are afraid of falling into lava tubes. These tubes form during volcanic eruption when the lava flow is flowing downstream, it begins to cool, and the exposed section of lava starts to harden and creates this sort of shell around the lava flow that's traveling underneath it. And that lava will continue to flow for months until it completely drains and leaves behind this hollowed out shell that makes this massive tube underground called a lava tube. 
And over time, nature just kind of reclaims the outside and inside of these lava tubes, giving the impression from the top looking down that it's just normal earth with trees and plants growing on top of it. But really underneath it is this massive underground hollow tunnel. Robert fell through what is called a skylight, which is a small hole at the top of one of these lava tubes. Because Hawaii is known for having lava tubes all over the island, residents have to be aware of skylights when they're walking around the island. But luckily in the high trafficked areas, they're very easy to identify and nobody's scared about falling into them. But if you go off the beaten path on the island to areas that are not particularly well trafficked, like Robert's super overgrown back part of his property, you could run into an undiscovered skylight. And experts say those skylights are difficult to identify because a lot of times in these areas that are totally overgrown and off the beaten path, the grass and the brush have kind of grown over the hole. And so you wouldn't necessarily see it. It would look like solid ground when in reality it was a death trap. Free diving is one of the most dangerous sports in the world even though technically pretty much anybody who's ever swam before has then also free dived because all free diving is, is diving underwater without the use of a breathing apparatus like a scuba tank. But when people talk about free diving, they're not talking about the kids down at the local swim club. They're talking about those crazy people that go out into the middle of the ocean, take huge gulps of air, and then dive down to unbelievable depths and stay down there for several minutes before returning to the surface. And within this already extreme sport, there's an even more extreme version of it called No Limits. Instead of the diver taking that big gulp of air on the surface and then turning around and thinning themselves down to depth or pulling themselves down on a weighted rope, in No Limits Free Diving, the divers are allowed to use whatever they want to get as deep as they can possibly handle. Again, the only rule is you can't use a breathing apparatus. The most common No Limits technique is to grab hold of this sled that is connected to this bottom weighted vertical cable and the free diver holds onto that sled, it's released from the surface and the sled rockets down to whatever their desired depth is and the diver just holds on and then once they reach the bottom the diver then turns a switch which shoots air into this big balloon that's attached to the sled and once the balloon is filled enough it will pull the sled and the diver who's hanging on to it back up the cable back up to the surface. Normally a no limits free dive using this technique takes approximately three minutes start to finish. The reason no limits is considered a more extreme version of free diving is because it allows the diver to go to these extraordinary depths that they physically are not capable of getting to on their own. We're talking about over 100 meters below the surface. There's just no way a person can just kick themselves down there. You would need the sled. And then conversely, you would not be able to swim 100 meters back up to the surface before you drown. You would have to use that balloon. And so in No Limits Free Diving, when you go down to these crazy depths, if your equipment fails, it's usually fatal. On October 12, 2002, 28-year-old Audrey Mestri was sitting on a floating platform off the coast of the Dominican Republic. The French native No Limits diver was mentally preparing herself for what she was about to do. Audrey was one of the best free divers in the world. And this day, she was trying to become the best free diver in the world by breaking the world record for the deepest depth achieved by a No Limits free diver, which was 170 meters. And that record was was actually held by her husband, Pippin Ferreris. But as she sat on that platform, doubt must have crept into her mind because storm clouds began to roll in and in the world of no limits free diving where so many things can go wrong, there's no reason to add in another risk factor like bad weather. It could affect the people on the surface that are trying to support you. It could affect the line that you're using to bring you down to depth. It's just an unnecessary risk. Also, Audrey was using a new piece of equipment. She had a slightly thinner cable that was gonna bring her down to the bottom that her sled was attached to but she didn't know if it would work for this deep of a dive. And her husband, who was in charge of safety for this dive, had been criticized in the diving community for rushing this record attempt that he hadn't done enough preparations. There weren't enough medical staff. There wasn't enough standby divers that were going to be on site or on shore at the time of this dive. And Audrey was aware of these criticisms because her husband was regularly criticized in the no limits free diving world. Because six years earlier, he had had two separate people on staff die during different diving accidents. And people accused Pippin of being very reckless. But despite all of these red flags and reasons not to do this dive on this day, Audrey was really confident and wanted to do this. 
and so she signaled to her team that she was ready to start. She zipped up her yellow wetsuit and then checked her sensors and video cameras she'd be using for the dive, and then she put on her fins. Meanwhile, her husband checked the balloon that was there to inflate and bring her back up to the surface. And because this piece of equipment was so crucial, Pippin insisted he was the only one that could touch it even though normal procedure was that at least two other people would inspect the balloon before the No Limits dive. But regardless, after Pippin inspected the balloon bag and determined it was good to go, he signaled to Audrey to tell her it was time to start. She slipped off the platform and waded her way over to the 200 pound sled that was going to take her the equivalent of two football fields below the surface. Just before Audrey gave the final go ahead to actually release the sled and begin this dive, she did a procedure known as packing, where free divers basically take a full breath of air in and then gulp down additional bits of oxygen to pack their lungs full and then when Audrey was done with this process and was ready to go she did give that final signal they released the sled and she began rocketing down towards the bottom of the ocean if all went to plan she would be back on the surface in three minutes Audrey's descent was going perfectly until she hit the 164 meter mark now because of the bad weather on the surface and all the rough water that new lightweight cable she had it was too light and so the waves caused it to sway and down at 164 meters that swaying caused kinks in the line itself and so as the sled was coming down it caught one of those kinks and stopped at the 164 meter mark and so Audrey just had to sit there for 30 seconds until finally that kink straightened out and she was able to continue down past the record setting mark of 170 meters. Now that 30 second delay might not have mattered if everything else in the dive went perfectly but unfortunately, it did not. Once Audrey had set the record by hitting 171 meters, her sled came to a stop, and now it was time for her to go back up to the surface. On the video, you can see Audrey begins following procedure, same as always. She reaches over and turns the valve that's supposed to inflate the balloon that's gonna bring her back to the surface. But after she turns the switch, Nothing happens, the balloon does not inflate. For a second, you can see a hint of panic in her body language as she's almost out of breath. She's already had that 30 second delay at the beginning and she's pressing up against that three minute mark and she needs to get to the surface right now. But she stays calm, she reaches over and she turns the switch again to see if maybe she hadn't turned it all the way the first time. But again, nothing happens. At this point, a standby diver noticed the sled was not moving up when it should have been, and so he rushed over and jammed one of his extra hoses with extra air up into the balloon and tried to inflate it himself. But there wasn't enough air coming out of this tank for it to fully inflate, and so the sled began to move painfully slowly up in the water column. Now you would think this standby diver who did have all sorts of extra air would just give the mouthpiece to Audrey to let her breathe on that. Forget the world record attempt, let's just save her life. But unfortunately, Audrey and the standby diver knew that because she was so deep, the pressure was so immense on her lungs, it had actually constricted her lungs to the size of oranges, that if she took even a tiny gulp of air at depth, that air would expand so dramatically on the way up, it would kill her. And so all Audrey could do was cling onto the sled and very slowly ascend and try to hold her breath as long as she could, but she knew at some point she was going to drown. And the video shows her absolutely stoic, just riding that sled, knowing that that's about to happen. On the surface, when the three minute mark came and went and Audrey did not surface, her husband immediately threw on scuba gear and leapt in to try to save her. And by the time he got down to her and brought her out of the water, she had been underwater without air for eight minutes and 40 seconds. When she was put on the boat, she had a pulse, but there wasn't a doctor on standby to treat her right away, and Pippin had kept her underwater for a couple additional minutes, trying to resuscitate her underwater. Audrey was ultimately rushed to a hospital where she was later pronounced dead. The cause of death was drowning. Some believe Pippin, her husband, had intentionally sabotaged her dive in order to kill her, but the official investigation determined her death was accidental. In 1993, after an exhaustive review of hundreds of sites around the United States, 
Executives from the German car company, Mercedes-Benz, had finally come to their decision. Tuscaloosa, Alabama would become the site of the first ever passenger car assembly factory outside of Germany. This was a historic day, not just for Mercedes, but also for Alabama. At the time, the state had one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation, and so residents of Alabama were hopeful this factory would create hundreds of new jobs. But what actually happened shattered their expectations. Immediately following this announcement by Mercedes that they were going to set up shop in Tuscaloosa, three other major automotive giants, Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai, all announced that they too would be setting up shop in Alabama. And so these four major factories all came with jobs of their own, and each of these factories attracted dozens of other smaller factories that supplied the parts to put together these cars. And so all these smaller factories came with additional jobs. And so this one decision by Mercedes didn't just create hundreds of new jobs in Alabama. It created tens of thousands of new jobs all across the state. Two years later, in 1995, a little girl named Regina Elsie was born just about an hour away from the Mercedes factory in Tuscaloosa. Growing up, the automotive manufacturing industry was a big part of her life. Her family worked in the factories, and as a kid, every day when she went outside, she would see dozens of these 18-wheelers come bombing down the road in front of her house, carrying car parts on their way to one of the many factories. Regina was a reserved and quiet kid. She loved to read, she was a good student, and she loved animals. She would take in stray animals. Any animal she could find, she would bring it back home to her house, but her favorite animal was her dog, who she named Cal. She dreamed of becoming a pediatrician, and so after high school, she enrolled in a local community community college on a federal grant with plans to eventually transfer out to Auburn University where she would finish her degree and then hopefully go on to medical school. But while she was at the community college, she fell in love with a local boy named Dan who she'd actually gone to kindergarten with. And before long, the two were engaged to be married. The young couple wanted to move in together, but they didn't have enough money. Regina was a full-time student, so she didn't have an income, and Dan barely made minimum wage working as a shelf stalker at Walmart. The only way they could get their own place would be if Regina dropped out of school and got a job too. This was a difficult decision for Regina because she still wanted to be a pediatrician, but at the same time, she was really excited about her future with Dan, and so she thought, you know, I'm only 20 years old, I can always come back and get my education later and become a doctor later. And so in January of 2016, she disenrolled from her classes and went out looking for a job. A month later, she landed a job as an assembly line worker at a car parts supplier factory where her stepfather and one of her sisters currently worked. It was called Agent USA and they supplied parts to Hyundai and to Kia. Regina's mother told her that it was not a great place to work that she had worked at two other similar auto parts supplier factories and the pace and pressure was unbearable. Car parts suppliers are known for being under intense pressure to reach their quotas every single day. Failure to do so, even by a slim margin, can lead to massive fines imposed on them by their customers, like in this case, Hyundai and Kia. This immense pressure on these suppliers often leads them to overwork their employees, like Regina. And the employees develop a sort of production at all costs mentality because they see their employer only cares about hitting their daily quota. And so employees will cut corners and skirt safety regulations to ensure they stay on their quota. But after Regina's mother approached her and told her about all these horrible things about the auto parts supplier factories, Regina said, I got bills to pay. She'd already moved into a house in southeastern Alabama near the Agent factory. She was living there with her fiance Dan and her beloved dog Cow. She had bought herself a brand new car, which she was very proud of, and she had found herself the perfect wedding dress that fit her just right, but it cost $4,000. And so Regina was not about to walk away from this job. She needed the money. When she first started at Agen, she was put on temporary status, which meant she only made $8.75 an hour. In order for her to make more money, she would need the company to shift her to full-time status, which came with a $1.75 per hour raise. Determined to show the company she was worthy of being shifted to that full-time status, Regina volunteered for 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. But by June of that year, after after six months of this hellacious work schedule, Regina was over it. And she went to her parents' house, she laid on the couch, 
and she told them that she just couldn't do it anymore. And in fact, she was gonna start looking for other work, preferably something she could do part-time so she could go back to school and continue to pursue her career as a pediatrician. And her family was relieved and excited to see her get her life back to normal. A few days later on June 18th, Regina, who was still employed at Agen, was working the day shift at the factory. Her job that day was to oversee a robot that would weld on these metal pillars onto the front right and the front left of the car where the side view mirrors would attach to. This robot looked like a giant arm protruding from the ground where at the end of the arm, where the hand would be, were two welding tips that stuck out about four inches each. The robot was surrounded by this huge chain link fence that was there specifically to keep the employees from getting too close to it while it was in operation. Regina would oversee this robot via a computer screen outside of that cage. At some point in the afternoon, as Regina is monitoring her computer, it comes across the screen that there is a stud fault on robot 23. Now, her robot was not Robot 23, it was the robot adjacent to her station, but the person in charge of overlooking Robot 23 was a part of her team, and her team had a daily quota to hit. And so having Robot 23 down directly impacted Regina. And so Gina stepped away from her computer, she walked over to the outside of Robot 23, she spoke to the team member, and they decided it was best to just call maintenance and have them come by and try to clear the fault. A security camera inside of the factory was aimed down at Regina Gina and her co-workers as they stood outside of the metal cage around Robot 23 waiting for maintenance. But after quite a while, maintenance still hadn't shown up and it was obvious the team was getting very anxious. They know every second that robot was not operational, they were hurting their chances of reaching their quota, which the company would be very upset about because they'd be hit with a big fine. And so at some point, Regina just kind of says, screw it, I'm gonna fix the fault myself. And so she picks up a small tool that looks like a screwdriver. She opens up the cage to robot 23 and she steps inside and walks right for the stem of the robot. When she gets over to it, she has her back to the robot's arm that's behind her, and she begins doing something with her tool to the stem of the robot. And whatever she does, it works because the robotic arm behind her springs into life and immediately goes back into the action it had been trying to perform before it failed. And that action involved swinging back in Regina's direction. And when it did, those two four inch welding tips at the end of the robotic arm were driven directly into Regina's back, impaling her. Her coworkers saw it happen and hit the emergency shutoff switch, but it didn't power down the robot until after it had thrust Regina Gina across the cage and pinned her up against the wall. And so with this robot now powered down, the welding tips were now run all the way through her upper back and pressed up against the wall. She was literally pinned to the wall like tacking up a piece of paper with two tacks in a cork board. She slouched over, but her eyes were wide open. She was conscious, but she didn't make a sound. Nobody knew how to release Regina from the robot's grasp. And so the team leader hopped on a forklift and sped across the factory floor towards the break room. He ran inside, he found a maintenance worker and he dragged him out, they got on the forklift. The maintenance worker had to sit on the team leader's lap and they sped back across the factory towards the Robot 23 cage. When they got there, they took this maintenance guy and basically thrust him into the cage and told him to get Regina out. But the maintenance worker didn't speak any English. He was terrified at what he was seeing Seeing, seeing Regina the way she was. He didn't really know how to fix the situation. Tempers were flaring, and before long, the maintenance worker just got overwhelmed and ran away. When emergency crews finally arrived several minutes later, Regina was still pinned by this robot. She was conscious, her eyes were wide open, and she was still totally silent. And they were able to get her off. They sent her to a hospital, and then she was transported to a trauma center, but it was too late. The damage that had been done to her by getting impaled by this robot was just too extensive and she died at the hospital. It would turn out Regina's company, Agen, had not properly trained her or any of her coworkers. Agen's policy was to hire people and as fast as possible, get them on the floor, helping them reach their quota. And so as a result, Regina and her team members had no idea about a so-called lockout procedure, where if you're gonna go inside one of these robots' cages, you need to make sure the power switch has been locked out, meaning it will not turn back on if you fix the fault that has caused your robot to stop. All Regina and her coworkers knew is that the most important thing is hitting your quota at the end of the day. 
And so that was the reason Regina went inside of the cage, and that was the reason Regina was killed. Agent ultimately pleaded guilty to not having properly trained Regina, leading to her death, and they paid the family $1.5 million. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please offer to get the like button a nice glass of sweet tea, but instead get them a glass of regular iced tea.